Okay, so welcome everybody to today's webinar session. My name is uh, Pasan Pellas and I work as a manufacturing application specialist. So during this session we're going to introduce, I've got very few slides just to introduce what digital prototyping is uh, and where Inventor fits in all this. Uh, and most of the session will be a kind of hands-on practical demonstration of uh, Inventor professional. Okay, so let's get started. So the manufacturing industry is actually quite diverse and it's compromised of segments and sub-segments. Uh, and we do recognize that uh, the challenges that customers face, for example, customers that work in, uh, in the industrial machinery segment face different challenges to the ones in, in the consumer or products. Okay, but the reality is that for uh, all the different companies and no matter where you are uh, in the industry space, the process that you have to follow in order to bring your product to market is actually in the challenges that these uh, that the companies face have actually more similarities than differences uh, and these are some of the most common business challenges that we've been hearing from uh, our customers so uh, cost reduction product complexity uh, so customers needs to be able to create uh, products that are flexible and agile uh, to change and very importantly being able to uh, compete in the global market as well. Now, I like these case studies that were uh, conducted by Tech Clarity uh, that kind of give you a sort of business background behind it. So in this study by Tech Clarity, they have identified some of the most common business strategies that manufacturers are putting in place in order to address these challenges. Excuse me, so not surprisingly, product differentiation through innovation and customization along with competing in the global market space are the top three uh, business strategies for growth so uh, we can also see the ability to uh, uh, complete to create a uh, flexible and agile products and also partnering up with local manufacturing businesses is also in the top five now the same study then focused on the top performance um, and what these companies are doing in order to achieve the superior financial performance. Now, in this case, the top performance were defined as those companies growing the revenue uh, and profits from two to two and, a to two and a half times faster than the average company in the study. So I guess the question here is how do they, how have they achieved this? Now, one common characteristic uh, through all these top performance is that they have um, extensively used the digital prototyping uh, processes uh, throughout their entire development process okay and that's not just for design and engineering uh, it goes all the way through to test and validation so simulation manufacturing and production and all the way through to sales and marketing and i would say furthermore to that these companies have also um, leveraged a comprehensive uh, data management approach uh, that allows multiple people and departments to collaborate into a single uh, digital model and this is really the idea behind digital prototyping, is having that one common source of truth where different departments can go in and pick the information they need as and when they need it. And digital prototyping will help us connect all these different departments that we have. And really importantly, will help us to create more space for innovation, which is really the top strategy here to create something uh, that innovative for the, the market, okay? It also gives us the ability to connect our different departments and actually drive our product development um, through our customer requirements, which is really important in our days. The, this makes even more sense if we look at the traditional product development methods. Um, now, during the traditional uh, development, uh, product development, uh, actually digital knowledge is actually quite hard to come by especially in the early uh, conceptual phases where our flexibility to make change is the highest. So as the data is uh, passed over to the engineering discipline, we can see incompatibilities that can result in decreases in productivity, which effectively drives up the cost as the data is being recreated and uh, all over again. Okay. Also discovering design, design flaws in later stages can also drive down productivity while further driving up the cost. Finally, also constructing physical prototypes can establish um, the product knowledge needed to refine and ultimately manufacture the product. 
and that can result in dramatically, dramatically increased costs and delayed time to market. So effectively we're getting all these dips in the productivity which then we get spikes in the cost uh, and this can be really unpredictable okay and it's not really a good result if we want uh, to have um, a smooth kind of a process development process here. And I think that's really where digital prototyping comes into play. Okay, so all of this digital prototyping helps us make great products. And this advantage is actually twofold. So first, more product knowledge is available at the earlier stages of the process. And because data loss is minimized or eliminated as we move downstream, and we don't actually have to, to construct as many physical prototypes, productivity is increased while costs are dramatically reduced. And second, our ability to innovate is increased. So this means we can get better products to market in less time, resulting in an increased revenue and market share uh, as our customers choose our product over the competition. So that's really all I had to, to kind of give a, a bit of the sales background behind it and uh, kind of define what digital prototyping is. Now, I'm going to jump into on my demonstration straight away because uh, I've got quite a few things to show you here. So. At the heart of digital prototyping and, and the Autodesk design suites is uh, Inventor. And this is really where we're going to concentrate on today's webinar. and trying to show you a few things, uh, starting from some sort of basic design, showing you some of the design accelerators that we have, uh, some little bits on the drawing environment. Uh, so as we move forward, hopefully you'll get a, a good feel of what the product looks like uh, and what uh, capabilities we have. OK, so in this example, uh, I'm going to Kind of show you some basic design we've got this um, frame structure where we're going to create a tank vessel and place it on top we're also going to go through um, and show you a lot of things on uh, the frame generator uh, so how we can create frames how we can analyze them uh, through simulation um, and using some automation on top of that as well okay so here we have our top level drawing for our assembly and we have placed some uh, basic views here and annotations what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually open my assembly directly from my drawing. Now the important thing to understand here for if you haven't got Inventor or never seen it before, uh, we have uh, interoperability between our DWG files and our actual assemblies. So any change I make in this uh, model here will reflect automatically in my DWG file. Okay, and the first thing I want to show you here is starting with some uh, basic inventor sort of uh, part modeling. So I'm going to create the vessel, the tank vessel that will go on top of the skid here. Okay, I'm going to start a new part. And I'm going to start a new sketch. Now, if you're coming from a 2D background, uh, 3D is not very hard to adopt. We're still using our 2D knowledge in here to create. Everything has to start from an initial sketch. Okay. So we're going to start by creating a rectangle here just to um, define, to start creating our tank. I'm going to set this line into a central line and create a, an ellipse circle. To the top. Like I would do with um, AutoCAD, I, I will extend my central line to the other end and start uh, trimming some of the lines that I don't need. So effectively what I'm trying to create here is the top level, is the top left quarter of my tank. And then once I've done that, you will see I will revolve the whole thing around to create the, the final shape. As you can see, I'm not uh, placing any dimensions yet. Uh, let's uh, click on and start placing uh, some dimensions here. Actually, I'm going to start with this side here. <clears throat> Okay, this now inventor knows that this is going to be a radial, um, so it's going to basically give me the, <coughs> the radius of my entire tank. So I'm not going to worry about the value just yet. I'm going to place another dimension on here for my uh, ellipse. And the power of inventor as com comparing it to um, AutoCAD, which is sort of direct input, is that we have parametric capabilities. So instead of me just typing a value for this dimension, I can actually point it to the value that I've already placed, the dimension I've already placed previously. And I'm going to use a very simple sort of equation to define um, a dimension for this uh, 
for, for this shape here, okay? Now, I'm actually going to change this. I don't have to use millimeters. I can change any units I like. So I'm going to set this to 2.5 meters. So I've got my initial shape. Okay, and we're going to place one dimension here at the bottom. Again, I'm going to point it to uh, the, my previous dimension and just do multiply it by two and take away one and a half meter. And you can see my sketch has turned uh, uh, blue or purple, if you like. Uh, and this means that my sketch is fully constrained, so there has there is no degrees of freedom to move uh, to move around. Okay, so let's finish. That was our initial sketch. Let's zoom out. And now I'm going to move into my 3D environment uh, and pick some of these profiles here and uh, actually create a revolve feature, as we call it. So effectively, I created the front bit of my tank. Okay, really quickly and easy to create that. We can then sell my shape here so I can create a, I can see the inside and set the thickness to 15 so we can see all the way through inside our the first half of our tank. Now I want to create the, uh, the nozzle at the, at the front uh, and the way I'm going to do this, I'm, we can create skits anywhere we like inside the 3D environment. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a plane and I can use the transform handles to uh, point it to where I want to be. Or I can say I want to show dimensions of my initial extrusion. I'm sorry about that. Let's do that. So dimension. I'm going to pick the dimension that I had here, and I'm going to set it to minus. So effectively, I'm creating a plane that's tangential to the front ellipse circle there. And I'm actually going to push it further for 300 millimeters. So I've got a custom work plane, and I'm going to create a, a new sketch here. So I can create uh, the 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 nozzle at the front here. We're going to create some circles. We're going to create one and then offset a few of them. So this circle is going to be for where my holes are going to go <clears throat> and another couple of circles that are going to be the neck uh, that will connect to uh, my tank. I'm also going to create a couple of reference lines that will help me uh, place the, the bolt, uh, the holes for the bolt connections. Okay, so no, I'm not using dimensions just yet. Let's start placing some dimensions on here. I'm going to set that to 715. You can see the rest of them are updating because I've used the offset command. I'm going to use that and point it to my first one. And let's say I want to take minus 107. And this, because this is going to be where my holes are going to go, I'm going to set this to construction. And then as for the neck, uh, let's place a dimension here. And I'm going to point it to this dimension here and take away 100 millimeters. So it's 100 millimeter distance from that. Now the thickness for my neck is going to be 8 millimeters. OK, so really quick sketch. Uh, let's take away the visibility of my plane. I start using my 3D uh, commands here to create the shape. I'm going to pick the, the neck and I'm going to say, I can use the transform handle to kind of pull, or I can say very cleverly, say two necks, so it's very nicely going to fit my shape at the back, and press OK. Now you'll notice my sketch has disappeared, but I can uh, bring that back into play, so I can continue creating some of the extrusions. Uh, so the next thing to do here is to uh, create, we've created the neck. We're going to set this to, let's say, 25. Actually, not Just need to make it a little bit thicker there. OK, so effectively, we created that. And the next thing we need to do is to create the holes. So we've got hole commands that we can point it to a point in my sketch. Okay, and I'm actually going to use my uh, mechanical or engineering details. Uh, so Inventor is very clever and knows this sort of standard that I want to use for this um, bolted connections here. So I've got my different standards that I can pick from. I'm going to use my ISO standards uh, and change that to uh, hex head cap screw here. And I'm going to set uh, the size to, let's say, M30. 
So this is information that will be kept and Inventor will know when I want to create a bolted connection, it will know exactly which bolt I need to place on there. My termination for this hole is going to be the back plate here. And once you can see the preview, it means you're in good track, so that's going to uh, work nicely. In case I've created the first one, the first hole, and I want to pattern that using a circular pattern around this axis here for, let's say, 20 holes we want to set for this. Okay. Now, the power of parametric, uh, of having a parametric modeler here is that I can always go back to my sketch that I had previously. And I want to place a dimension here to define the distance between uh, the holes that I have here. And again, I'm going to use a very simple equation. I'm going to say 360 divided by 20, which is the number of holes divided by 2. And that will effectively give me a 9 millimeter distance for that. And you'll notice that Inventor automatically has repositioned the holes on here. OK, let's create a, another extrusion. I'm going to pick the middle circle. And I'm, this time, I'm going to cut to next. So effectively, I've got the hole, and I can look all the way through my, my model. OK, we don't need the sketch anymore. We can turn the visibility off. Uh, maybe we're going to create some uh, chamfers for this. Um, let's set this to 25. Put one at the back here. If, they, if we wanted to create proper welds, we can put this into an assembly and create proper welds for this, but I'm just showing you the, uh, the part environment in this case. Now, obviously, I need to create the rest of my tank here. If I try to mirror that, I've left that in purpose. Uh, with the, we can't do that because of the, the cell feature that we have created here. But I've done that in purpose because I want to show you, again, the power of Inventor. We can move our end of part all the way to the beginning, where I just started and did my initial revolution. And I'm actually going to mirror this now. My mirror then this revolution feature, and I'm going to use my origin plane. So effectively, I've got the entire tank. And I don't have to recreate the rest of the features. I can simply move my end of part to the bottom, and you can see my, uh, my tank has uh, now been created. OK, let's uh, give this uh, a material here. We can go to materials. I'm going to set it to uh, still high strength alloy. And Inventor is also giving it a default sort of um, appearance or color, if you like. OK. Now, the next thing uh, is I want to create the, the small nozzles that go on the top of the tank. Now, I've created um, features like this in the past, OK? And I, I, w I, don't, I want to save myself some time of having to recreate all these features for the top nozzles here. And what, I've, what you can do with an Inventor is you can create what we call eye features. So eye features are safe features that we can uh, really quickly place again into another shape uh, of, in, in a similar shape like we have here for our tank. So let's go into our eye features and, and pick one of these. Uh, now instead of having to recreate this, all Inventor needs for me to do is to uh, set three criteria. So a reference point is going to be my origin center point. My sketch plane is going to be my uh, XY plane that I initially created my sketch on, and my surface is going to be the cylindrical surface here. I'm going to set this to 90 and click Next. These are, I'll just uh, move that around. So these are the details, the nominal diameter, uh, and start the offset that we'll create. If I click Finish, you can see the nozzle has been created. I'm going to do the same thing again. Reference point, sketch plane surface, but this time I'm going to set it to minus 90, so effectively I've got the other one uh, on the other end. And actually, if I go back to through my 3D model, I'm going to choose to mirror this last eye feature. I'm going to again use my origin planes, use the XY planes, so I've got another nozzle at the bottom. OK, so one final thing to create is I want to create a custom UCS. Uh, I'm going to actually place it uh, two meters below my tank so that this will help me when I bring this tank to quickly constrain it to my assembly. OK, so let's save this file. Go back into my workspace. I'm going to name this vessel, let's say vessel B. 
Okay, so that's really the, the, the part environment, just a quick example. What we can do here is we can maybe create a, a new drawing for this. Um, the drawings are similar. We can have our prompts like we, we have inside a, our familiar AutoCAD environment. I can set the scale or I can edit any other attribute within my, my title block. Now, with, within Inventor, I can, I've got the ability to create uh, base views. So actually, let's set this to 1 over 25. Well, with the new version of 20, 2016 here, we can change the orientation. So we've got a, an, actually a view cube here that we can manipulate our model. So we can change the orientation as we like for our initial view. So that looks OK. And then I can create projected views from there. So one here, one there, and maybe create an ISO view at the top. And click OK. I'm going to set the ISO view to shaded so that we can see that quite nicely here. Let's move these around a little bit. I'm going to edit here and say I want to create this view, the tangent edges, and also show my hidden lines. So you can see we can obviously adapt to our company standards here if we like. Let's right click uh, on these, both of these views actually, and right click and say automated central lines. Uh, I don't want the whole features. Uh, I want to bring any kind of cylindrical revolt features. And press OK. So effectively, I've got my nice central lines here to work with. I can also I can start placing dimensions through my annotation tab. But if I go on a dimension that I've already created during when I was designing this, I can say uh, retrieve dimensions from here. Select the dimension. Maybe I want to pick this here and press OK. So I'll bring that in play. Then we can start creating some baseline dimensions from here to that. Right click and say continue. And place those across. Okay, in a similar manner, I can do the left side of my tank. Okay, maybe we want to make this the origin, so I've got a nice equal value here to work with. Right click create. If we look at the other view here, let's uh, create some dimensions, radial dimension for the overall radius. You can see here my different standards. I can add any kind of custom symbols I like, mess about with a, with a precision. Okay, in this case, I just want to go ahead and place that dimension. Place my thickness here. Maybe move it a little bit around. OK, so very quick way of creating uh, dimensions, uh, similar to what we have in AutoCAD, but uh, even more intuitive. So for this top uh, drawing here, again, I can say I want to automate central lines. This time I want to bring some of the hole information as well, so um, I can see where the holes are on, my, on the nozzles. We've got different types of views we can create. We can create a detailed view. So let's create a detailed view for here. Uh, let's set this to 1 over 10, maybe, just to round it up uh, and place that. Let's break the link and make this into shaded. We could even create a projected view from our detailed view. So something like this and create it here. Let's move this to the bottom. Place another nice view here. We've got the ability to create section views. So for example, I could let's click section views, click on the view here, and create a central line from here and then continue. Place that initially. Uh, I'm actually going to bring the alignment so I can move that forwards. OK, and these are um, live sections, so I can move them. Uh, I can edit the section properties. And instead of uh, saying I want this for full, I can send the distance to, let's say, 275 millimeters. 
and that will automatically update the uh, section view that I created from here. Okay, let's place um, let's place a dimension for this nozzle, and show you so, so a different way we can kind of collaborate for that. So I'm just going to place a dimension for here. I'm going to save my drawing at this stage. And I'm going to export this into um, a DWF file. Now, DWF files are really uh, good for kind of communicating uh, uh, design changes that we want to make. So let's say in this particular example that we've taken a measurement for the nozzle and we realize that the nozzle needs to be uh, either bigger or sort of radius. Okay, so in this particular instance, in that case, I'm going to create a really quickly create a DWF file and start creating some markups on here for uh, the other people to see. So I'm going to create a, a rectangle balloon and say maybe I want to replace this um, with a 300 MB nozzle. Okay, maybe I want to put a stump here for say rejected. Move that around if we want to put it somewhere nicer. Okay, so then we can uh, either put this through our email it to the people that are involved who can put it through our data management system. In this case, I'm going to uh, keep it simple. I'm going to save my DWF file and exit here. So the next person that goes and views the design model has got the ability to go inside the workspace and open the DWF file that the other person has created. And what Inventor does in this case, it overlays it on top so we can see what the changes we need to make. Okay, so we can open our tank here and just make sure I'm, so that's the, the single one at the front. If I look at my eye features, I can edit my eye feature here. And actually we've got the ability to change to different diameters, different standards that we have created here and press next. And that will automatically update the nozzle for me. And if I switch back to my drawing, now you'll see that has already changed the dimension. It has changed the appearance on here. We can actually go into our action that we had here for our markup and say this has now been done. Okay, and, then, and so on and so forth. So you can save this DWF, email it back, um, showing that, that this has now been completed. So let's close the markup already saved that. Okay, so the next thing to do here is to start placing our, our tank here inside our assembly. So if I return to my top level assembly, this is the assembly environment and I can place different components in here. I'm going to go into my workspace and bring the new vessel tank that I created. I'm going to place it anywhere in the space at the moment just one, one instance of that and I'm going to con constrain my my two UCS points here to fully constrain that into space. Okay so this is now if I try to move that I can't move that so if we switch to the other side maybe we want to bring um, the nozzle uh, we want to bring actually the manhole at the front so I'm going to start placing a new component. Uh, I'm going to use some of my libraries here Let's go to supplier content and look for the manhole cover that I'm looking to bring in. Again, I'm going to place it anywhere in space. And I'm going to use some of our new constraints that we have. I want to create a rigid constraint between the center of this and the center of the nozzle there. I'm going to reverse the direction and then Align this. Let's re reverse that. That looks okay. Go ahead and press okay to that. Okay, so let's look at um, this part in particular. Now we've got very, uh, very quick direct editing capabilities. Now this is an assembly, and I'm actually going to dig through and go into the actual part that we have here. And what I wanted to show you here is we've got even ability to 
copy features. So I'm going to right click and say I want to copy these features because I want to create the handle here in the connection with my tank and paste it in, in my tank nozzle. Okay, so I've, I've copied these features. I'm going to return back to my top level assembly and okay, so let's close this so we can edit our tank in context and see all the rest of the parts have been grayed out. I'm going to right click and, and say paste. And all inventor here is, uh, is asking me to uh, create uh, some reference plane similar, similar to what we have in, in our eye features. Okay, so my plane is going to be my uh, XY plane. My axis is going to be the axis around the nozzle and my reference point is going to be the center of this circle here. Go ahead and press finish. And here you can see we've created the the same sort of uh, handle to make our connection for uh, for the manhole here. So I'm going to return to my top level assembly. Actually, no, before I do that, let's uh, edit that again. And <clears throat> I want to change, make these adaptive so they can actually change to when I try to put a constraint or explain what that means. So I'm, I'm creating adaptive features, the last two features that I created, I'm setting them to adaptive. So if I return to my top level assembly and, for example, I want to constrain this face to the bottom face and hit apply, because it's adaptive, it's going to automatically know and move these features around. And I'm also going to create a, an actual constraint between the two, so effectively I've created the connection for the manhole. Okay, so if I get rid of the rigid constraint that I created earlier, or maybe even suppress it, you can now see we've got the movement for the front of my tank. Very nicely we can do that. Let's uh, bring that and suppress that. So very powerful direct um, editing capabilities here. Okay, so the next thing um, I wanted to show you here is let's bring on some uh, frames here and bring on the, the leg, the foot, the floor support for our tank. I'm going to use my plus command again. Let me increase that a little bit. So the foot support, we're going to place it anywhere in space. I'm going to use my normal traditional constraints and put an actual constraint between that and the tank and also create some flux constraints so I can bring that and uh, align it with the plate. So also this face with that. Okay, so that's now fully constrained. Now, one of the designs accelerator that um, I wanted to show you here that we have is our ability to create bolted connections. So this is the first design accelerator that, we can, that we're going to start using. Okay, uh, and we've got the ability to uh, start a bolted connection here. Um, so this is my um, design accelerator. I can go different options of placement. I'm going to use by hole. So what is my start plane is going to be this. Where is the existing hole? So if I hover on top, it actually picks the hole from the bottom plate, but will actually create the holes for the top one when, when I'm finished. And the termination for my bolted connection is obviously the bottom plate here. Now, I could go inside my um, content center here and start picking from uh, my library of different uh, fasteners, bolts uh, that we have. Now here are the uh, basically access in my content center, the different kind of standards we have. I can filter that with ISO and start picking the bolts and the fasteners that we want. But um, actually what I've done here for to make it a little bit quicker is we can, obviously you can use that. I've saved a template for that. Okay, so if I've got something that I create more than once, I can automatically, that will set the right parts that I need for my bolted connection really quickly. And not only that, but I can say follow the pattern so that you can automatically follow the pattern in my plate. And don't forget, it's creating the holes for the top plate as well. So really quickly, instead of um, you know wasting time going, trying to set these manually and create the holes, this is what design accelerators are for. Okay. So I guess the next thing here is to create uh, the support on the other side. I'm going to use my 
pattern. I'm going to pick these three components and say I want to pattern them using that direction. Um, two is fine, and I'm actually go. I've created some custom parameters to re remind me of what the value is for the foot spacing here. And go ahead and click OK. OK, now inside our, our environment, we also have the ability to uh, do analyze interference. So for example, uh, if I wanted to check if there's any interference for the stuff that I've been creating so far, I can set that. And you can automatically see that I haven't been paying great much still of attention. And you know, one of the, the nozzles that I created earlier is actually uh, colliding with, with my uh, foot, with, with the support I have for the tank. Okay, so I've got that. I'm very easily able to um, resolve that. If I go uh, inside one of the eye features that we created here, Okay, I'm going to edit this feature and change the offset here. So instead of uh, origin offset, set that to two meters, click next and finish. That will effectively move both the nozzles a little bit further back and effectively uh, resolve my uh, collision. Okay, so at this stage, I'm going to save my, my assembly here. Okay, so some migrating to the latest version there. And what I'm going to show you here next is uh, some bits with our frame generator, the next design accelerator that we have. Now, Invento has the ability to create different representations. Now, I've got one that I showed you from the start. I've got one for steel work, which basically it unsuppresses a feature that I've created, like uh, on the top here, for uh, for accessing uh, the top of my tank. Okay, and this is quite neat. I'm actually going to open this individually so we can start creating some of the frames. Now, the frame generator is a very powerful tool. Um, and as you can see here, the best way to kind of work with the frame generator is to create what we call a skeletal model. So this is simply an extrusion that will give me the basic shape for my where my frames are going to be placed on. And the reason for that is that then I can control the dimensions of my entire platform here by just changing the dimensions of this basic shape. Okay, and that will make sense more as, as we move forward. So let's switch to our next design accelerator and start placing some uh, frames onto this. Now this is the frame generator and we have our different standards like we normally do. I'm going to use the BSI standards here, uh, the different types that we have. So if I toggle through these you actually get a nice preview of the different types that we have on here. Okay, the size, uh, let's set this to this. Uh, our material, it can be a different uh, standard material or we can maybe set this to, let's say, still galvanized and actually start picking on some of the edges of my uh, skeletal model. If I click on this, you'll see that's not quite the position I want. I want to toggle this, so this is probably the night, the best position for where I want it to be, that to be placed. And I'm going to click on the rest of the edges of my reference, of my reference part here to create uh, my first frames. I'm going to click Apply. Inventor will give me the names of the new parts that will be created. Don't forget that if we had uh, very simple vault capabilities here, we can control the file naming where these files go, etc. you know, full data management capabilities for that. Okay, so these first frames have been created. Uh, I think I've created a space for another T frame here. So let's look into for a structural T. Okay, I want an uh, orientation on the top. Uh, let's set this to default here. And I'm going to pick one of the I'm not sure if you can see that properly, but you can see it's on the wrong angle. I'm going to set this to 90. That's upside down, minus 90. That looks better. And go ahead and press apply. New part name. That's cool. That's great. And one final um, frame. I want to create the, the roll bars. I've created a 3D sketch that will kind of show me where these uh, are going to be placed. So all I need to do at this stage is go back into my design accelerator. Uh, I'm going to look for 
circular hollow section called formed. Obviously, I wanted this to be centered in the middle. Uh, 33 by 7 by 3, I believe that is. I could pick individual lines. I can right click and say I want to pick the entire sketch. So this will automatically create these. You can see it's quite nicely placed on there. I'm actually going to merge this into a single file just to make things a bit easier for me. So there's just going to be a single file for that. And Inventor will automatically create a row bar. So maybe I could have changed the material. don't want that to be galvanized, but that's OK for the time being. And now we're going to start kind of um, cleaning uh, things up. So we've got very neat tools here where we can uh, use our mitre, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And we can go around our frame and say, I want to mitre these two together. Click OK, so it's created a nice uh, angle for us here there. And do the same thing for the other sides. Let's move on here. Move up to the other side and back to there. OK, we also have uh, the notch capabilities, which is useful for uh, frames like this. So I want to notch my T-shape to the side frame on this side. And the same thing for the other side as well. So these parts, if I switch maybe to uh, part priority, select other, let's pick my frame here. I'll just show you what that looks like if I open it up individually. It's created the, the cuts for us in here. I'm going to save it right now. So I'm going to edit my actual platform because I want to create a, a pattern for my T-shape. So I'm going to pick this. I'm going to use this as a column, reverse the, the direction from the other side. Now again, I've created some uh, parameters here, so rounded beam calculation and the beam spacing. So that will effectively give me a nice repetition there. It will also create, maintain the end treatments for those. OK, so that's really quickly how we can create a, a frame structure like this. Uh, if we have the right information on there, so having a skeletal model, uh, we can see how quickly that is to create. And if I was, for example, to, so let's, let's go back to our assembly here. You can see that has uh, already updated. I'm going to save this at the stage because I want to show you the, what the bill of material looks like. Okay, a lot of new files really quickly created, reusing a lot of the stuff that we had. If I go under my Manage tab, uh, Bill of Materials. Okay, so this is something that we can export, we can bring it inside our drawing. We've got different ways, so this is how my everything is modeled at the moment. So if I expand this, then I get all the relevant files, or we can have a structured version where we can bring in different columns. Uh, we have our different frame members that we saw earlier that we created, and all the parts involved, or a parts-only kind of um, interface for that. So this, yeah, like I mentioned, we can export it, we can place it in, inside our drawing and manipulate it as much as we like. Okay, I'm going to save again, uh, say yes to that. Now, one thing that we're going to be looking later on today is our ability to use uh, uh, so design automation, in this case, iLogic. And what I've done for this particular uh, ladder, like I mentioned earlier, because I have created a skeleton model, I've got the ability to change dimensions for that. OK, and what I've actually done is I've created a, a quick little form here that will enable me to manipulate the size of my in, entire sort of frame structure at the top of my tank. And let's expand this a little bit so we can see that properly. And I'll maybe set that to the length to 750 and hit apply.
an inventor would change the entire, um, will update my different frames, will keep all the end treatments, and not only that, but will actually add some extra features like the ladder that we can see here. Uh, so that shows you the level of automation, and this is honestly it was really simple, as we will see on, on the next session on how to do that. Okay, let's um, actually I want to run this again. actually I want to be able to see the, the nozzle at the front of my tank. Is that enough? Yeah, I can see that. That's fine. And then I've got a hole to connect on there as well. That's great. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to show you here is uh, we've got the ability to do a lot of tube and piping. Okay, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. I'm just going to show you some of the uh, stuff that we can do in here. So with tube and piping, again, a very intuitive environment. Uh, I'm going to edit my tube and pipes here, and I want to create a connection from there to the top of my tank, and also create one of the uh, stainless steel tubes that goes all the way through to the, to the pressure gauge. The way this works is that we have different styles of tubes. Okay, Three main categories are uh, rigid pipes and fittings, our tubes and bends, and our flexible hose. And under that, we've got different standards that we can play with. Um, now, if we want, we could create our own from scratch. All we need basically, so if I show you, for example, a welded steel pipe, this is compromised of three parts, a straight segment, an, el an elbow of 90 and 45 degrees. And when we put this together, then Bento can create a, a pipe routing for us. We don't have to create things from scratch. We can always copy that and create our alterations as we like to save some time. Okay, so make sure in here I'm in the right standard. So I'm going to use my BS actually in this case. I'm going to activate this. Let's first of all place uh, a component here. Uh, let's go inside this run. I'm going to place a fitting. Uh, actually, I want to create a, a T. So here we've got our content center hundreds and hundreds of different uh, parts that we can pick from according to our standards. This time I'm actually filtering it, just looking at the DIN ones. And when I pick, let's say, one of the T here that I already have. This is an eye part, so I've got the different sizes that I can choose from. I can choose using the sort of main tables here just for nominal diameter and serial number. But I could actually have the full details in the table view where it gives me all the designation size designations that I want. So in this case, I'm just going to click the one I know that I can use. You can see how it snaps, uh, automatically snaps to my existing pipe route. I'm just going to create the cut for it and place it properly. I'm going to enter the angle to change the orientation so that it looks the right way. And press OK. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, to connect the, the, the connection at the top, uh, I'm going to switch to my pipe priority. And I want to pick one of these uh, parts that I have here uh, for the socket. And I'm going to, instead of going through my content center very quickly, I can pick on one I've already placed. And I'm just going to reuse that. I want to say I want to connect that to the top of the tank here. And click done. OK. So that's all I needed. I can now start creating my new route for this connection. I'm under the right standards. And I can create manual sketches, but in most of the cases, actually, the automated routing is what I can use. So from here to there, origin to destination. And you can see I'm getting a preview of different kind of options that I have. And I can toggle between them. I can have five segments. Actually, probably the three segments is uh, better for me. So it's created a 3D sketch for me. I'm actually going to edit the position of this top one uh, and just increase it by, let's say, 400. And I'm going to finish that. I'm going to then populate the route, which will effectively create all the segments for that pipe run. So just to finalize this, maybe switch to my pipe priority, pick one of these valves, place fitting, and 
Oops, sorry about that. Okay, spitting, and then just connect it to my pipe here. Okay. Uh, as for our rigid, let's create, I'm going to finish this. Let's see where we are, tube and pipe runs, that's great. Um, this time I'm going to change my styles and I'm going to go into my stainless steel tubing. I'm going to activate this and I'm going to create a new pipe run for that. And I basically, like I mentioned earlier, I want to create the connection from this all the way through to my pressure gauge. Uh, so let's start looking at some of the automated features that we have here. I'm going to create a new route. Actually, I'm going to bring my origin planes. Origin planes are useful because I can snap to them, so I can. it will help me with the automated routing to place it through these different um, geometries. So I'm going to start my route, set my origin. I'm going to come down here and actually I'm going to right click and say I want to activate point snap so I can snap to the planes. So if we look at my sketch here, this is already, if I click on that plane, you can see it's creating the 3D sketch for me. Uh, I want to say perpendicular to this plane. So effectively you can see how this is creates the bends according to the, the bend rules that I have for that particular tube pipe. And I'm going to bring it down to here using the same method, perpendicular to face. Oops, sorry about that. Let's bring that. Okay, perpendicular to face, so it's come all the way down. Uh, I know it's going to go through there, so I'm going to go straight into this plane, perpendicular. Click that twice, or all the way up to here. Similar to this plane. And one final thing is my destination at the bottom. Again, I get the different uh, design alternatives. That's probably the one I'm looking for. And that is it. I'm going to finish the route. Populate that, and I've really quickly created my rigid uh, tube and pipe. Okay, so hopefully that's given a good idea. That's uh, in terms of uh, tube and piping for this uh, demo. Now, another thing I wanted to show you is a, bit, a few more things uh, in regards to the, the frame generator. So I'm going to finish this drawing, finish the model here. Obviously, if I go back to my original drawing that we started with, that will now will have already automatically updated. It's not showing the tube and pipe because I've told it not to. What we can do is we can change, we can go to the original. So if I start to say that to, to piping, that will automatically show me the piping as well. Okay. Now the next example I wanted to show you here if we go to our actually I need to change I'm not going to save this To that, let me just uh, switch my project and go under Simon here. Let's open up another frame generator uh, example here just to show you how this works. Now, again, I've used a skeleton model in this particular example, uh, so, so this is sort of, sort of the conveyor bridge. That we're going to be creating but I wanted to show you some more ways of how we can reuse content and not having to recreate stuff okay so under my design I'm going to start using my my reuse uh, command for, for my frame generator I want to create the rest of these frames that the structures that I, uh, that I have here uh, actually let's start from the top so I want to reuse this one and just place it on the other side where I have got my sketch and go ahead and click apply
do the same thing. I go for, for this frame to this side. Click apply. So I don't actually have to go into my content center. I can reuse a lot of the contents. I can create some of these frames. Uh, if I take one of these, for example, and I want to recreate the top ones, but I want to make a slight alteration because obviously this is going the other way, I can always go to change or reuse. For this particular one, you can see the end treatments were on the wrong side because I basically reused the previous one, but I can always reverse the member direction, which will effectively create the, uh, the right um, end treatments for that. Okay, so look, let's look at the top. Actually, if I switch to the start so we can see what's happening here. And I'm going to reuse again. Let's uh, pick this. Uh, and I'm going to copy it across to the rest of my uh, reference lines. Do the same thing for this side. Go ahead and apply and you can see how quickly I'm kind of going through building my, my design here without having to recreate information. Okay, uh, so what we need to hit do here is uh, start uh, making this look a little bit nicer. So I'm going to use uh, my mighty commands. This with that. So if I click apply, you can see it picks both of the frame members because uh, I've created that relationship between them. Uh, and I want to do the same for these with the bottom frames as well. So you can see how it's created a nice angle on this side. And same thing for this side as well. We also want to uh, notch like we did previously. So all this with that. So it keeps the relationship so it saves you time for having to do them individually as well. So both sides have, uh, have been done here. Now you'll notice there is an issue with the top left there. Let's resolve that. So if I right click this frame number, I want to say I want to break reuse number. And then I'm going to use my miter again from here to there. Okay, so that looks a lot better now. Okay, and really nice capabilities here um, it's because of the, of the other if you look at the other side I'm missing some of these frames and again I don't want to have to create new sketches and uh, start going through the content center let's look at what some of these frames here um, so hopefully yeah so these are the ones I'm going to actually pick this um, four bottom frames here And we've got the ability to demo these, or I don't like that word particularly, but we can create a, a sub-assembly for those uh, particular parts that we can then uh, manipulate. So I'm going to call this cross bracing, just to show you how flexible this is. So this will take those particular parts and place them into an, an individual sub-assembly. And then we can actually go inside our conveyor bridge and create a, a pattern, circular pattern of our cross bracing assembly, uh, which what is my axis, my axis would probably be my origin Y. Sorry about that. So sorry, the Z axis in this particular case. I'm going to set this to 2, and I'll set this the direction to 180. So if I look at the other side of my model, this has created the rest uh, of the frames that I needed. OK, um, so let's return to my top level assembly here. I'm actually going to switch to my conveyor, so I can see my conveyor as well. Turn the visibility of my reference uh, model. And I want to create the other side uh, for this. So again, using my pattern, I'm going to uh, 
as in, the, in this entire component around the cost of matches that I've created here. And use the same method. I want to set this to 2 to 180 and go ahead and press OK. OK, so this is the full conveyor. And not only that, but with that, even with all these changes that I've made, I th hopefully I'll still be able to use the, the iLogic automation that I had previously. So with this, I'm basically exposing the reference model parameters that we saw earlier. So the conveyor bits frame, so this one here I suppressed. But by changing these dimensions, my entire uh, assembly will automatically update. Okay, so maybe we can start with the height. Let's set this to four meters. This time, as soon as I, the change is made automatically and the frame structure will automatically update. Uh, let's uh, change the width here. Uh, set that to one, one meter, let's see. Just to show you how all these work. Okay, so it's doing a lot of work in the background here to do, and uh, let's change that to 950. I, it just needed to update there, so hopefully yeah, it's still doing something here. Go ahead and press done. Okay, so we you can see how easily we can create something that is flexible and agile, and we can uh, adjust it according to our requirements here. Okay, so one thing I didn't get the chance to really show you properly was the last little bit on the frame analysis, which I, I did want to kind of pay, maybe do a separate webinar for if you need to. Um, but apologies for misunderstanding the time frames I had for that webinar. I thought it was set to one hour and I thought it was already over the time limit there. But let's have a quick look at what the frame analysis looks like. And in this example that we tried to see there was, we've got a frame structure which is um, also controlled by a skeleton model like we saw in the examples previously. And I want to run some analysis on here to make sure that whatever I'm designing uh, is, is tending towards the right direction. So I've activated my frame analysis tool and I create a new analysis. In this particular example I could maybe simulate with or without the cross beams at the bottom. Uh, I'm just going to do with cross beams just a single analysis to show you how this works. We've got the ability to do static or modal analysis uh, and change the state like I mentioned the different level of representations that we have with or without cross beams. Okay so I'm going to go ahead and test this with the cross beams on. Now what Inventor is doing here is uh, it's analyzing my frame structure and is creating uh, the links between uh, my different components if we zoom in here I can see all the connections between uh, the frame members and uh, actually the nodes and the, the, the rigid links that were created for this and one of the first things that we have to do first of all here is to set our our origin, uh, sorry, our fixed constraints so my frame is fixed at the bottom with these four legs, and I'm just going to create these constraints inside my frame analysis environment. Okay, so the next thing to do here is to just tweak a little bit the, the relationship that we have for the cross beams here. Uh, so, for example, if I use my release command, uh, I can highlight some of these beams, the cross beams here. And I can control the constraints that are around these. I can set the. Actually, I don't want any rotation on the x and y, but there will be a rotation on the uh, x axis. Sorry, set on the y and z and the x axis. And the same that is for the beam start, but also for the beam end, I want to have the same situation here. Okay, so it's for all these beams, I can apply these conditions on here. And also, finally, I want to suppress the link, the rigid link that is between the two ones just to make it a little bit more realistic. Okay, so once I'm done let's have a look. I've got my model browser, I've got all the different nodes, the beams, the links, the release conditions, the fixed constraints, uh, and now I need to start putting some loads into this. I'm going to use the top six frames that I have here just to, uh, I'm going to actually apply a load. I'm going to click on more options and expand here. Unfortunately, just bear in mind that this data set is set to inches. Um, 
I need to recreate this. Uh, so I'm going to set this to, let's say, £600,000 uh, divided by 6. This is the number of beams that this weight was going to be applied on. I'm going to set it to relative and put 0 0.5, so that's right in the center of the beam. And click apply, and I'm going to do the same thing for the rest. Uh, oh no, sorry, it's changed to relative and set to 0 0.5. And do the same thing for the other beams. Okay, so hopefully I will now have six forces, including my, my gravity here. So we can do different things. If we wanted to do something like lifting, we could uh, edit the gravity. Uh, and <coughs> change the direction etc but in this particular example we just want that force in those particular frames just to show you how this works so at this stage we are ready to uh, run this simulation okay so this is a bit exaggerated it's kind of adjusted to multiplied by by five which is as soon as the results come true let me change that to multiply by one so at least we can see uh, what is happening in uh, to our frame we can use our animation tools here to uh, produce an animation and show our results if we want to. Control the, st the speed and the steps. If we look at our results themselves, at the moment I'm looking at displacement. Don't forget this is inches. Okay, for the maximum displacement for what those particular beams. And we have different types of results that we can inspect. We can see the forces, we can see the moments. The normal stress, probably if we switch to the S max here. We can draw the visibility of the color bar by setting this different maximum. So if we set it to something a bit lower, we'll be able to see better the coloring and the, the, the issues that we have in our beams. Okay. So these are the different things, shear stress and different diagrams that we can create. We can probe and look at particular values. So let's look at uh, one of the origins if I highlight that. And we can get our, our, our probe and our, and our values for that. Um, we can have beam details, that's quite a useful. We can select one of the beams uh, and see the different forces that we get, the moments. So, this is for this beam, particularly here, where we can look at the S max, shear stresses, etc. And all the results and calculations are displayed on the right, and we can pick any beam that we like to, to produce this. Okay, so if I actually let's go for beam detail and let's say S max or maybe the MX and press OK. So that will actually be added to my diagrams. Uh, <coughs> we can have uh, diagrams actually on all the beams or selected beams, so we can pick some of the beams here. And let's say we wanted to see the MX for these particular ones, we get the values. We can export that and communicate our design intent. Uh, we can put our maximum S max on there as well. Okay, so different things we can calculate uh, and it will give us a good idea as to whether uh, this uh, frame structure will perform uh, or whether, whether we're designing to the towards the right direction. Okay, so these are some very basic kind of simulation tools that we, that you get built in inside Inventor. But don't forget, within with some very simple sort of uh, additions, for example, with um, NASA and INCAD, we can do nonlinear simulations. We we can do buckling, etc., and actually visibly see the results uh, inside our Inventor. But this is more like in a preliminary stage just to make sure that wherever we're designing uh, is called the right uh, we're in the right course. Okay, one thing actually I didn't show you here, we can also have the ability to export uh, generate a report from here. This might take a little bit of time but it generates uh, views that we want and generates a report in uh, HTML format that we can then communicate internally or externally. 
Okay, there's a lot of other things that we can do in here. Uh, I'm just going to keep it simple at the time being. If you want to do a dedicated webinar to this, we can uh, arrange that as well. Uh, and with that, really, that was a really quick example. Uh, let me just jump on just to wrap things up here. So what we saw within the frame analysis, uh, the sort of different design parameters that we can control here, the pos position, length, the shape and orientation and the support, and some sort of user-defined and industry codes criteria that we can uh, view in the results, so max deformation limit, max stress limit, critical buckling load, uh, and the dynamic behavior of our uh, design. If we wanted to take it a step further from there, if, and if, even further than uh, do a full structural analysis, then actually getting the, the robot structural analysis then is the, the, the step, the next step to that. Okay, so that's a different kind of area uh, outside my exp expertise, to be honest. But uh, there is specialists that can assist you with uh, more information on, on RSA. Okay, so these are some of the things that we see there. So uh, connection and support calculation dynamic analysis like seismic and, and mobile loads, uh, variable selection, uh, and we can manipulate the GUI for, uh, for the frame structure. So just a quick little um, snippet there to close everything up. I would like to uh, apologize for a little confusion near the end there, um, and to thank you very much for taking the time to uh, joining the session. If there is any questions, Please don't hesitate to uh, email anyone from Great Tech like Karina, for example, here, and I'll, um, I will pick the, your queries up and I can communicate back uh, and address this uh, as and when needed. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for taking the time and I hope to see you in one of our next sessions. Thank you.